Hello, and thank you for joining us today. This is Pat Wagner with Pattern Research in Denver, Colorado, on behalf of Do Space in Omaha. And the program today is about choosing photos and art for online communication, particularly for webinars. And want to thank you for joining us today. Want to tell you a little bit about my background. And before we do that, I want to do kind of a shout out on behalf of Do Space. And I'm not paid to do this, <laughs> not paid specifically to say Do Space is wonderful. I work with libraries and universities throughout the United States and Canada. And if you don't already realize that the Do Space project is unique, the idea that you have, and I'm going to read this, a community technology library dedicated to empowering our community through access to technology and innovative learning experiences experiences is something that I hope all of you take advantage of. And if you're watching this from outside Omaha, consider that this may be a model that would work in your community as well. So for those of you who don't know me, I've been a trainer and consultant for libraries, universities, local government, nonprofits, and small business since 1978. And before I was doing this, I was involved in the world of graphic design. I actually had a graphic art studio in Denver, and I want to make it clear that I had three incredibly talented artists working for me. Myself, I can't draw a tree if my life depended on it. And I was very much in love with graphic design. I have a, a mind in graphic design, but I want to tell you that I first learned about graphic design and understanding the importance of color and type and so on way back in the 60s where I was being taught by a professional journalist how to deal with ideas like photojournalism and what that was about. So I've been able to watch decade by decade as different fads have come and go over issues of what is legible and what's not legible and what's the right way to do things and what's the wrong way to do things. And for the record, I want to tell you that I don't want you to let anyone bully you into thinking that there's only one right best way to do things. In fact, when a client comes to me with a project and says, what's the best way to do this? I said, I don't know the best way. I know some better ways. I know some ways that might help what you're doing a little bit. But a lot of what we're talking about is as subjective as picking a favorite flavor of ice cream. Ice cream works. It works for most of us. I love chocolate, of course. I love chocolate. But it's interesting. My husband loves vanilla. And I don't drink coffee. I don't even like coffee that much. But how did I decide that my standard for celebration was coffee haagen -Dazs? I have no idea where that came from. And I sometimes feel that's the same thing when we're talking about design and photos. I do love color. I do love type. When I first started working for Do Space earlier this year, I started with their logo. I extracted the colors from it using one of those color pickers that you can use online that will help you identify the numerical number, which is called a hex code for the particular color that you want from an image or something, and then allow, allow you to use that on your, on your uh, device. And uh, I use this, as you'll see throughout the programs, I developed a template that matched what was there. And I picked a particular type style that was close to what they were using called Open Sans. I love that. I love cute kitten photos. I really love that. And I have to find a way to produce things that are pretty good, not perfect, um, in the time frame that I have. By the end of this year, I will have done 96 webinars. And that doesn't count other kind of instructional design projects as well. So for me, this isn't theory. This is what I have to do every other day is figuring out how to make my programs engaging, knowing that, nope, I'll never be able to draw a tree. My favorite place for getting free public domain art is from pixabay.com. It's uh, based in Europe, which means that the images they offer, which are from amateur and professional photographers and artists from all over the world, have a different, you might say, flavor than if it was just based in the United States or Canada. And I support them, and I hope you do too. And as you'll see, a couple of the photos that we have are from the Wagner family as well. So the program here was designed for people who know nothing, and I hope that you'll enjoy it with me. Every program I do has a key idea, and the key idea here is that when we're thinking of integrating images and in what we're doing online, and let's include, too, um, images that you might uh, use in social media, 
of some kind, particularly if you're using one of those contact, content rich older platforms like LinkedIn or Twitter or Facebook, and you want people to pay attention to what you're writing or on your blog, for example, you want images there as well. You want to be able to think about the image as something that has a story to it, or something that will engage people. I think that our ability to look at great images and to appreciate what they look at has degraded. It's like devolved a little bit in past years. Again, in the olden day before electricity, when I was growing up, you would have Life Magazine and Look Magazine and the National Geographic coming to your house. And you had some of the best photographers in the world um, contributing to those magazines. and. I think a lot of us grew up with these amazing images and so on. Now, I think it's great that anyone can own a device that they can take a thousand photos of whatever they're doing. And that's really cool. But that doesn't mean those are a thousand really good photos. So I hope that you'll consider going and looking at sites where you're going to find the best work of the photojournalists. And isn't it wonderful that we all have access to those kinds of sites and really start thinking about what makes it different if it's a professional who really knows what they're doing. So for anything that we're doing, we're looking for the story and the technical things we do to a piece of art is to enhance that story. It's like you might have a story in your head that you want to write down but you might want some help in how can I write this story so people read it and are engaged and as happy as I am as when I wrote the story as well. So a lot of times it means not just picking the first thing you see, but being able to look at different photos and images and think, which is the better story? For the images that I use in a typical webinar, I probably scan, and when I say scan, look at quickly. I look at quickly and um, think about probably 50 images for the one that I finally choose. And here's a good example. I decided, okay, I'll indulge myself and look at kittens. And I found these images and I probably looked at 30 or 40 kitten images until I found a couple that really said what I was trying to say. Here are two very similar images. In fact, they might even be litter mates, I think. And then you have to ask yourself if you were just to put one of these images on a poster, in a webinar, in social media, which one without a caption is the most compelling story? Now we can disagree about this because it's personal choice. I'm gonna bet that many of you chose the picture on the right. There's a sense of anticipation. What is it that's surprising the kitten? What are they going to see? The kitten um, on the left, it's more subtle, which doesn't mean that it would be a bad one, but I would say that if I had to choose between these two photos, I would choose the one in the right because it implies a more interesting, engaging kind of um, story. And you have this feeling that something's going to happen next. And you kind of caught the, the cat in the middle of something. And I think that's also an aspect of a great story. I have a friend back in, in, uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin, who's an award-winning photojournalist, and his specialties are sports, particularly basketball, and also space launches. And he's always driving or flying down to Florida for various space launches. And he used to uh, post on his social media portfolios of his work. His name's Al Fredrickson. And I asked him, I've known him since we were teenagers, and I asked him, how in the world do you get those incredible shots. I mean, really those sports illustrated, oh my goodness, shots of people playing basketball. It's not like you say, okay guys, that was like really good. Could you like do it over again? But maybe like put your left hand up higher or something. And he says, you have to keep looking. You have to look for a situation that you think is going to give you those great shots. And you keep looking and looking and snapping and snapping and snapping. It's not like you snap one shot a day. You snap hundreds and hundreds at a particular event. Well, when we're looking for art, it's kind of the same thing. Now that we have all of these great free and inexpensive resources to look for images, why not take a little time and look for the ones that better serve what we're trying to do?
Another thing we have to think about is that whole issue of subjectivity. Why do I like coffee ice cream best? I have no idea. And so even though I want to give you generalized tools to today, full confession is that you are kind of stuck with what I like, which tends to be let's say a little bit more old fashioned, tends to be pragmatic, meaning my programs are not just to entertain people, but to engage them so they remember material and ideas. So if you look at this old photo, it's overexposed, right? The lighting is wrong. It's an old enough photo that it was damaged in storage and it'll never look the same. But this is an incredibly important photo to me because it's the best, happiest photo I have of myself and my older sister. And so when I look at that, there's layers of meaning to it that I think the average person might say, well, this is fun. It looks like two young girls and they look really happy. And the older one has her arms around the younger one looking, you know, very happy to be there. And I mean, everyone's looks happy and there's sunshine and everything. Technically not the best photo in the world, but my dad caught something there that is really important to me. So we have to decide when we're choosing art, are we thinking of it as a fine artist, which tends to be very subjective, or are we thinking about it as a commercial artist? So here's an example I'd like to share. It has to do with memory and architecture. Some people immediately can tell from my accent that I grew up in Chicago on the South Side. I always have to say South Side of Chicago, but always a Cubs fan. And this is of downtown Chicago along the Chicago River and the iconic bridges that are part and parcel of downtown Chicago. Now, when I look at this photo, and this is, a, this is not a photo I took, it's a professionally done photo. There's several things that I like. I like the color, I like the patterns and the design about this, but it means so much more. I spent my childhood uh, going to piano lessons in downtown Chicago. I have walked over those bridges over and over again. I have driven, when I could drive a car, I've driven up and down those roads. To the right of us, that round building is the Marina Towers that was actually built uh, by the father of one of the kids I went to school with. So, oh my goodness, does this mean so much more than an attractive, interesting photo of downtown Chicago? There's layers of things. But I am not presenting to a group of people from Chicago. Many of you um, either live or work, uh, maybe even born and raised in the greater Omaha area. So for you, it's like, well, maybe you might recognize it, maybe not. I'm guessing this photo might mean more to you, the Flatiron Building, which has gone through many different, um, how would you say, evolutions, as I understand. I read into the history a little bit, and it was supposed to be designed after the iconic uh, Flatiron Building in New York City. And um, during the renewal that's gone on that really has transformed parts of downtown Omaha, um, it has become part of that. So there's a good chance that if you live in Omaha, you have walked by that building. Maybe you have used the services there. I understand that uh, last time I checked, there were some nice restaurants and venues there. You might have gone in it. This photo probably means emotionally a lot more to you than the photo that I showed before. The, the Chicago photo, right? This is the one that would mean more to you. And I think that's a really important part of doing images in knowing your audience and being accurate about that. I just finished this year a project with the Medical Library Association, uh, Smart Cookies, wow. And it was part of developing some courses for them on various subjects. And the audience were mostly uh, medical librarians who work in hospitals and medical schools and pharmaceutical companies and research firms, right? The Center for Disease Control, all those different folks that we're more familiar with today because of the pandemic. And part of it was uh, illustrated by cartoons of different kinds. So I was in charge of the text content and they hired a brilliant instructional designer with a lot of experience to do all the fancy bells and whistles and images. Well, a great deal of the art had to do with people. So it was cartoons of people doing things and um, that interactively. 
So we did the first round of things and I was a little skeptical, but I kept my mouth shut because sometimes it's better to pick your battles. But I was so grateful when we took the first draft and sent it off to the committee. And the committee immediately came back and said, those people don't look like us. We don't dress that way. Um, you know, what was, what was the person thinking? Well, the instructional designer had never been in the typical medical library and out of certain, I'd say outside of certain very formal institutions, uh, people who work in medical libraries don't necessarily wear three-piece suits. This is not how they dress. And um, let's just say that his choices were what I would say were kind of monochromatic, if you get my drift. So by the time the committee and the other folks were done with it, the images looked like the people they were trying to serve. And so it's not just what we think and feel. It's really putting ourselves in the shoes of the audience, particularly if you're like me, you're trying to teach people something, educate them. We want something that they can relate to and has that, that pull to them as well. Part of the fun I have to say is doing programs for clients all over the country is for example, I just finished some work for some people in Louisiana and part of it was going through images from their state that were pulled from you know nature's work and things that were very much identifiable as from where they were. And I got some real compliments from people who said, I loved what you did because you took the time not to just give us generic photos, but photos that meant something to us. And in a couple of cases, we could even identify where it was and what you were doing. I do a lot of work in Florida and it's really fun to be able to say, okay, this is a photo from this particular swamp. This is a photo from this particular city. Uh, the the uh, beaches on the east coast of Florida look different from the west coast of Florida, which looks different from the Florida Keys, which looks different from the Panhandle. You know, it doesn't take that much time. Sometimes it only takes me about five or 10 minutes to find that right photo. Boy, it, it uh, buys so much credibility with the audience that I'm trying to reach as well. I don't do the corporate stuff so much. I have had corporate clients. I had a seven year contract with a big company, can't mention their name. Their initials were AT&T, but no names. And I find a lot of corporate stuff pretty bland, pretty boring. Um, and it's trying not to offend anyone to the point that there's sort of nothing there. Like this is probably a really good photo if you were trying to sell that furniture. <laughs> but as far as telling anything about human beings and the kind of work I do, not so much. There are people who love the corporate collections of photos. And to me, most of them look like the old underwear ads out of Sears catalogs. Uh, where they're trying to look like something that they aren't. I'm sorry. See, that's Pat's subjective bias. And since we have resources like Pixabay and other places, we don't need when we're uh, people who don't have money, don't have time, don't have training and experience, don't have the training on the fancy Photoshop stuff. Um, there's no reason that we have to use the corporate photos. So that's a personal thing on my part. And um, it's like my coffee ice cream, okay? Take it with a grain of salt though, all right? So we do assume that people looking at this class have no time, money, or training. And that um, picking an image that's strong and powerful doesn't mean that you're gonna be able to necessarily create it yourself. You're gonna have to look at what's there. So in this case, I do love the Do Space logo and I do love the strong colors in it. And I use it throughout in the template that I've, um, designed to uh, you know plug in the text and the art and so on. And by the way, if you have to do webinars or something for a client, a friend, for your own organization, a really good place to start is to take a look at the logo and the colors that are used in what we sometimes call the corporate or the graphic identity of the institution. So when somebody hires me from a university, from a city, from a nonprofit, from you know, a, a library, whatever it is, the first thing I do is look at the logo and look at the type. And then everything I do is built around the colors to reinforce what's there. Between you and me, I have clients who have logos uglier than anything. They're horrible. In fact, I've told them half kiddingly that I would offer for free 
to engage my graphic designer. I have a formal designer I use for things like our, our logo and our formal stuff, who's just totally awesome with 40 years experience because they're really ugly. And in both cases, the director said, yes, we agree, it's awful. And um, B, uh, A, we agree it's awful. And B, we're gonna have to wait until the chair of our board uh, retires because they're in love with the logo and stuff like that. But what I wanted to do was to base images in part that I use around the strength of this logo, which is a pretty powerful logo, as you see. And so that's what I did. So I picked this image because the colors in the image, which I pulled off of Pixabay, kind of went along with what do space was about so that's kind of the fun of it too is that you can align what you do in terms of images and art with what you already have create that framework as well if you notice too from the beginning shot what we had on the opening page i had found this trez adorable ferret and i crop the fer ferret and oftentimes I will have one or two identifying icons on every page for consistency. So everything I do with DoSpace it, in the lower left hand corner is the DoSpace logo. Then I have a footer that has text in it that says kind of what we're, we're working on. I have page numbers because I want to orient people. And then I often have a piece of art throughout that kind of ties things together. And I like something kind of fun. And so I figure this is a great one to emphasize focus on stuff. And I'll talk about why I use animals in a minute as well to do this. So what do we hope to do in this program? Okay, we want to be able to help you pick better images and by better it means it better engages people who are watching your webinar or engaging with your social media and so on. Uh, that when you find a good photo that you really like, things you can do that to make it better. And everything I do in these situations is simply what I can do using PowerPoint. PowerPoint is free. PowerPoint is available on um, PCs and on Macs. And maybe on your PC or Mac, it wasn't free. It came free with my situation. And um, they're simple to use. They don't give you a huge amount of choices, but it lets you do some stuff. And for a lot of what we want to do, we don't have the time and energy to spend hours tweaking something. We, we have a limited amount of ability. So again, in the limits we're working on, how can we tweak things? And then we also, that whole thing of images that unintentionally carry wrong emotional message and the thing that I avoid, and I'll talk more about this too, is I don't use images very much anymore of people. I sometimes use some images of children. Sometimes I use international images of different kinds. But for the most part, I don't use images of people because audiences read too much into them. They bring a lot of their own stuff and then they decide if they're right or they're wrong. Um, and I don't want that to be a distraction. I don't really want that to be a distraction. So I use nature, I use architecture, I use um, abstract designs, um, just different things like that to be able to engage people. And it seems to work pretty well with my audiences. So what's the agenda? Well, we're gonna talk about the great webinar image debate. I've seen people stand on chairs and yell at each other at conferences about this. A few logistical issues about dealing with uh, modifying images. The whole thing of the photojournalist model, which I think is a keystone for thinking about your images, right? To really think about what that story is. And then we're gonna take a photo an, a big ugly photo <laughs> that I found and turn it into something that I hope is more interesting, maybe even a little bit more attractive, just using three or four steps of technology that is available right there <laughs> in front of you on um, the PowerPoint um, 
set. And if you use something similar to PowerPoint from another app and stuff, everybody sort of has the same tools available. And I didn't do the things of screen capture because I would have to basically do screen captures on five or six different programs, which we don't have time here uh, today and could be just confusing. So I, I didn't want that to be the focus today. And then I, I have some resources that I think you might find very useful as well. So we have, I think, a couple of pages at resources at the end to share with you. So here's the thing. When you're talking about presenting a webinar, is it images or is it text or what's the ratio between the two? Now this happens to be an image that I love. It's an image of old mosaics and I liked it so much that I gave it to our instructional designer, a man named Phil Norman here in, in Colorado, who uh, just amazing graphic designer, commercial and fine artist and stuff. And I said, here, Phil, we're pattern research. This is what I'm thinking about. And he came up with something astounding that was like the first, the first draft he gave us was absolutely perfect. When I do webinars at a conference, there's a lot of people presenting slides of, of different kinds. And I will get people in the audience beforehand talking about their own experience producing webinars and slide decks. And boy, it really is like theology. It's like having a group of Chicago Cubs and White Sox fans in the same room. And some of them will say, the best way to do a slide deck or a webinar is no text at all. And other people will say, no, no, it should only be text. Otherwise, the images aren't accessible to everyone in the room. And I just listen. <laughs> I never tried to debate because I've just seen too many studies say A or B or C, and there's a secret they won't tell you. Most of the studies done on legibility and responsiveness are done with college students, 18 to 22, who are a part of a study. My audiences tend to be adult learners who are years, if not decades, older than that, and they have different needs and ideas. Also, if you start, and I've done this, dug into some of the studies where everyone is saying, oh, so-and-so did a study and they did this and this, which means this way of doing it is superior, come to find out there were, and I'm not exaggerating, 12 people in the study. Well, human beings, you know, just they're, they're more varied than that. So there's some things that we try to do. There's some things that we try to do that we think are gonna make things better. But again, don't let anyone bully you if you're choosing one end of the um, argument than the other who says somehow you're doing it wrong. Like again, there's some Bible that says there's only one way to do it. That's simply not true. And remember, graphic design is like culture and English. It's a moving target that's always evolving or devolving, <laughs> depending on your opinion. Uh, so what didn't work last year might work this year, who knows, or vice versa. Also, what's neat is that you can simply use type and make something look really, really good. And you can use the same type with different colors and make something that looks really good and fun. Now, in this particular image, I wasn't concerned about legibility. So I wasn't concerned that the different colors would be confusing. I would rarely use something that has so many different colors in one image. But if you notice, it's the same type style, in this case called Open Sans, which is very widely available. And a graphic designer who worked for me introduced me to it. And I love it when I need this particular type. So there's things you can do with color that are a lot of fun. So say you're on a project and you don't have access to images, you can play with color a little bit. And why not? Why not have a little fun with that? So one way to think about content and image is think about the fact that you have a gallery of photos and you're a docent, somebody who explains things, and you're walking through the art gallery, right? Pointing to things and telling a story. You're in, far, in front of posters. And we can think of these as we do a slide. So one of the things we talk about is the idea of having a storyboard to say, here's the first image, here's the second image, here's the third image. They do this a lot in making movies, uh, but it's also, I think, very useful if you have something that is an image 
rich program of some kind that you're presenting or you're presenting these ideas online. So you want to have someone stand in front of the picture and imagine that you are standing in front of the picture, in front of a live audience, and you're telling them something important. And somehow the images that you have chosen are telling that story. So this is a story that I might tell about Colorado today. And let's say, for example, that I want to tell people about you're coming to visit our lovely state, Colorado. And as someone who's lived here for um, 45 years, what are the things that I love about the state that I would want to share with you? So I might start with the uh, usual images. And the first is one of our iconic uh, aspen forests in springtime and say, this is what uh, Colorado is like in the springtime and early summer. We're rich with greenery. You can have an outdoor experience that in effect is very intimate. And maybe you want to take a, a hike through a wildflower uh, garden or something like that. That's the kind of thing that might be available to you. And then the second image, I think, is what a lot of people think of Colorado, right? Our uh, majestic 14,000-foot mountain range, um, the uh, forests and the valleys and stuff. And by the way, this uh, is being produced right after those epic fires that we're having. Stuff is coming back. Everyone is very hopeful. And uh, having experience uh, as a country with things like the Yellowstone fires and so on, we know that things are going to come back. And I've seen some great photos of our, our elk herds and wild birds and stuff coming back. So I just had to reassure people. But then I might say, and this is an image of the majesty, the big picture, the big picture of Colorado and talk about that. I might not even refer to the photo. I might just be talking with this beautiful photo. And then the third photo, I might say, and this is the mystery of Colorado, the ancient civilizations that were there, um, all the kind of layers of who was there doing what and so on. And this is from the Mesa Verde National Park and uh, some of the ruins there, which are quite incredible. But we also have like dinosaur monument, a whole bunch of different places. So I'm telling a story about visiting Colorado and I have three images. And again, while I would be talking about visiting Colorado outdoors and not even referring to the images, the images would add an extra layer. They would kind of illustrate the story that I was telling. Or I might be telling a story with steps of different kinds, step one, step two, step three. And in this case, it's the evolution <laughs> or the life story of a dandelion. And I was not interested in the photos being perfect in terms of scientific information. What I wanted to do was to show the fact that those little funny yellow flowers, as we all know, explode when they're ripe into something that's sort of wonderful. I mean, it looks like a star, doesn't it? It looks like something from the cosmos. And unfortunately, in this day and age, it also looks like a coronavirus. And then even at the end, when it's time to fall apart and to spread its seeds all over our lawns and stuff, there's something very beautiful about it. And um, the first photo was something that all I did was have to crop it. The second photo was white. It was just pearly white. And I went, uh, I need something a little more captivating. So I used one of the tools um, on um, the uh, uh, PowerPoint site and just gave it a little tint of pink just to pop the color just a little bit. And with the last one, this is pretty much what it looked like, but I enhanced the color a little bit, just a little bit. And so they're not 100%, the last two aren't 100% natural. But again, it's something I could talk about to enhance the image, to give people more information about it. Um, step one, step two, step three. And what we remember is, is it something that can help people remember the story? Now, if I was going for scientific accuracy, I wouldn't have changed uh, number two and three. I would have kept them the way they were. But in this example, I wanted it more than scientific accuracy. I wanted something that was engaging as well. 
So when we talk about education, which is what I spend most of my time doing, we have something called the gold standard in education. At least it's one version of the gold standard. There are 50 major conflicting theories of how people learn, right? And that's just outside of like graphic design and so on. Okay, so what we wanna do is we want to have people remember what we've presented to them in however we're doing it, including what we might have in our blog or in our social media. We want to, in my world, not just have them entertain, be entertained or think about something. We also hope that it might inspire them to some sort of decision and action about something. I'm in my work, it's not just that I'm trying to change someone's mind. I'm trying to get them to do something differently and maybe do it to the extent that observers would notice. For example, I teach a lot of programs on customer service and it makes me feel terrific when I get a feedback from a boss who sent customers, sent their internal customers, their staff to one of my meetings and said, not only did they enjoy it, Pat, they had fun and they laughed, but I can see and hear they're actually different in terms of how they're behaving at the front desk. And we're getting some compliments from our external customers that we didn't get before. So it's retaining the information, being inspired to apply it, and then actually applying it in the real world. And that's kind of the gold standard of what I'm going for in the programs that I do. So when we think about the gold standard, we think of things that are not just about text and images. We wanna make sure, first of all, that in the content, we have a little theory, some facts mixed together, um, examples of what we're talking about, and stories, and stories. I think stories really help people remember things. We have the text and images. And when I was first doing graphic design, oftentimes I would be working for a magazine, or a newspaper of some kind, or I'd be producing content as a writer. So because we were so limited by space, I would have an editor call me up and say, Pat, we love your work. Now, if you want us to do it, we will, but we need to cut back one third of what you've written because we only have so many column inches that we fit because we just got an advertisement and we have to take out some of your text to put in the advertisement. So from a very early age in thinking of text and images, I thought of them together because we didn't have the inf infinite palette, the infinite canvas that we do online. So I still think about text and images. What is it that I'm trying to say and how do I say it and what are the steps that I take? And then ways that inter uh, interact, getting people to think about things or have assignments, being able to comment and ask questions I think is important. Or a mind exercise where I just want them to think about things. So images are a part of all of this that we're trying to do to reach that gold standard, to get people to be inspired to remain, to remember and to be able to be inspired to take some sort of action as well. So one of the best models I ever learned, again, was that photojournalist model. And thank you, Mrs. Heft, <laughs> for teaching a whole bunch of us that model. By the way, that's how I met Al Fredrickson because he was in the same classes that I was taking in photojournalism that long ago period. So here are some logistical issues that you should be thinking about if you, before we actually talk about the heart of photojournalism, but the thing about dealing with photos. All right, first of all, we have to deal with copyright. We are really careful in our office about where we look for images to make sure that we either pay for them or they are legitimately in the public domain, or we can use Creative Commons or something written down to acknowledge ownership and so on. We really, really are careful about it. However, a few years ago, uh, the main place we used was Flickr and the Flickr site. And I found some images I really liked. And the person who put them there said, oh, public domain, use them as we, you want and everything like that. Well, about three years later, I got a letter from the Getty organization, which basically curates a lot of photos. You know, they take them, they sell them and everything. It turned out that the person who had put them up on Flickr had lied. They actually 
didn't have ownership, or they did, and they sold them to Getty. And for two little photos that we had used twice, Getty was charging us $1,000. We could have fought it in court. We could have. But by the time you pay all your court fees for everything, and they're in a different city and everything, it was useless. And so we scraped up the money to pay them, stopped using Flickr at all um, about things. And I'm glad to say that some people actually took out class action suits because it was like I could show that legitimately we did everything right. And what the gentleman from Getty said, it's just like stolen merchandise, just because you thought you had a paid receipt for the merchandise doesn't let you off the hook that the merchandise was stolen. And my thing is then why don't you just take the merchandise back rather than charge us? But that was another deal. So that's why we use the uh, public domain sites like uh, Pixabay, which I think are much better um, than Flickr was. But also if we use anything outside, don't assume that simply because you saw it published in a magazine or online that there is not copyright issues. And even some of the degreed professionals I work with, like university personnel and librarians, think that everything they do is fair use and they have carte blanche to use whatever they want. And that's simply not true. And it's rude. <laughs> it's not just that it's, you know, illegal and unethical, it's rude. So don't make assumptions. And one place, by the way, people fall down is they think if you have a copyrighted image, a, a thing like an icon, like something from the Disney organization, that as long as you're not using the image, like you're taking a picture of a doll or something, that that's good enough. And usually it's not to protect you. Anything you do, if you find an image you like, you want to make sure that you back up the originals that you have before doing any changes of any kind. And I'll tell you, the day that you find that great photograph, great photograph, and you put it on your device and you start messing with it and you haven't been able to get a backup done and you can't back out of what you're doing and you say, no big deal, I'll just go to the site that I found it from and pick it out again. And that's the day that image will have disappeared and you'll never find it again. It has happened to me. So you want to make sure that if you've got that image you're working on, backups, backup, backups, and assume that you're going to mess up so you have a clean copy you can go back. Another image is the issue of compatibility. And I started in the computer world in 1976 and remember all the things like, oh, we're all going to be compatible and work together and won't it be wonderful? Well, my friends at DoSpace know that even though we both have some technical savvy, I send PDFs of everything I knew, do, just not just the slides, because I can't count on that compatibility. So if you're taking images that you have on device A and they need to work on device B, please don't assume at the last minute that everything will be fine. Do some tests, send images back and forth. You may be shocked that there's some, what we used to call funny characters hidden in the image that somehow your computer decides it's not going to accept. And suddenly it doesn't work and you'll never know why. Uh, so we want to test everything every time to see the images look well. For most of those programs I've done, mentioning my webinars, we have done a tech check or we log on early enough to do a tech check and run through the slides to make sure that they look okay. And we don't want to do any tricky things. Um, we have to be very careful about the cloud. Be the cloud is just somebody else's computer. It's not magical, okay? It's not some wonderful celestial kingdom where everything is perfect about stuff. And if we're using links for people to be able to see an image, we have to realize that links go away. And um, all technology sucks. So if you don't have the hard image on your device to use, Again, that link may go away, and then when you're presenting your wonderful thing, uh, it ends up a blank. I have a couple of friends who run blogs, and I love the text, but consistently they link to images that they lose the link. And so when you go to the blog, it's just this empty space with a question mark. Very unpleasant. 
We also, and this is something really important, the idea of post duplication, meaning that you have an image you really like and you want to use it over and over and over again. Well, the iconic story, and this happened here in Denver, is when we used to have those big, thick inserts in our daily newspapers, when everybody got the daily newspapers, and on Wednesdays, you have that thing with all the advertising in full color. And everyone remembers here the week that one of the major daily newspapers had two advertisements for two different car companies in the same handout and guess what they use the same image and everyone had a good laugh and it was very embarrassing so what i try to do since i have all these free resources available it's so cool is that i actually keep track because i do this for a living of who gets what images so if i have an image that i'm using here for do space that i really like every time i do a new program for do space 99 percent of the time I'm using new images. If I'm doing a program for um, another organization on a similar topic, I use fresh images. If I do a program for a client from three years ago, and basically they said, oh, do that nice thing you did. You know, my brain is different. How I see things are different. And I go through and tweak. And even if I love the images were there, guess what? I find new images as well to do that. And again, that whole thing of formatting, you're doing something funny to this image in terms of color or size. Does it work or not? And that's something that you can't 100% predict. So you want to test and test and test and try things out. You know, I have a bunch of friends who are very tolerant and we do this for each other. So if any of us are trying out something new in terms of formatting and so on, I say, I'd like to send this to you as a PDF. I'd like to send this to you as a slide. And, and could you do a screen capture and show me how it looks on your machine, just to be sure, right? We can't be complacent. It, it kind of loses the respect people have for us if, our, if our, uh, the work that we do is continually, let me call it funky, okay? I guess that's a new way of doing it. So we all have a balance. The emotions that people experience looking at an image are on our planet better at selling things, getting people to want to take action of some kind than simply sticking to the facts. But whatever stories that you tell, let's make sure the stories, if people check on the facts, the facts are there. I'm one of these people who is just adamant about not posting anything unless I've done my due diligence that satisfies me that the information I'm posting is correct. And my standard is it would hold up in a courtroom if someone was saying, why did you put that number in there? Where did you learn from? Well, let's look at the context. Hmm, Pat, it seems that you picked the only example in that study that fit your particular bias and all the other information was counter to that. Could you explain that to me? So uh, trained as a journalist, I look at multiple sources, including ones I don't agree with. So again, we want to back up those images with things that people can believe. Now, here's a fun story that I put together, and this was for a, um, a program I did, I think it was two years ago, three years ago. And I'll see if anyone can guess. All of these images have something in common. And yes, all but one of them are of animals, wild animals. That's for semi-wild animals. Uh, all of them are taken outside. We have the one of the plants. But I wonder if anyone wants to guess what they all are. And this was a fun one for me to speak over because all of the images uh, in this particular grid are all of um, examples of images used in political parties around the, around the world. So some people might say, yeah, I recognize the elephant and the donkey, but I didn't recognize the fact that a raccoon or a porcupine or a pelican might be an image taken from some political party here or in another country. And it was fun when I was doing this particular program and talking over the images, the people who were there for this uh, basically political um, pr presentation I was doing was having a real, a, a lot of fun trying to guess. And of course they were cheating and looking up online and so on. So it was a lot of fun, but this is one of these great things where you can put 
collection up and say, what do you think all these have in common? And uh, if you're work, particularly working with younger folks or families, it's something everybody can pitch in and say, this is what I think it is. So this is something very, very simple that you can do. You can also, when you're thinking of stories, realizing you can use what is basically the same image to tell two or more totally different stories. So, and th this is an image that the original was black and white. I colorized it, meaning that I just applied one color, which was this kind of gold color to it um, to indicate what I thought was age. I wanted it to look a little bit like a ghost. I wanted it to look like something that had been precious in the past, but wasn't in the current moment. There was something I wanted to make that was mysterious and nostalgic out of this image having to do with photos and the fact that there was a point where this would have been the best camera that you could have bought with a normal income for your family. We have one like this, by the way. Uh, that was something that my Uncle Jack got for my dad on his high school graduation in 1934, something like this. And you can still buy these online. In fact, I think uh, that was one of the sites that, that helped me look for this particular image, right? So there's certain things that I was trying to say in this image. Now, here's what is basically the same camera but look at the difference in the image. This is an image of somebody who has taken one of those old cameras and kept it in beautiful shape. Look how lovely the, the leather is oiled and every piece of metal on it just shines. And there are some old photos there, but you get the feeling that this is somebody who appreciates something, that a classic tool and maybe they're still using it. Maybe there's a connection between the past and the future. Or this was a story where we wanted to show the immediacy of the tool. So even though it might've been taken decades ago, it was right there currently being used. It wasn't a ghost. One way, by the way, if you look carefully, you can see that this was an act of use. If you look in the tool to the upper left-hand corner of the camera, you'll see that there's this big patch of worn silver where people would be holding the camera and clicking the, um, the, the, the button on it there. Uh, but I thought, what a great image. And this says something very different than the other image, even though they're both of old camera. So that's another thing to find a great image and see which different ways you can use it. So when we're telling a story, what is it that attracts people? And for me, it's very much like theater where you're telling something that's going to be on stage that has a beginning and a middle and an end. And when you talk about writing a play, almost all plays are based on a crisis and a resolution put a bunch of people together, something happens and something gets resolved and things change. So it's impact. I like stories where good people win, not just about ain't it awful. So in my programs, unless I'm trying to make a point about something bad, I still want to end with something good happening. Uh, that engages people more. You know, I, I think it's a mistake if you are cause driven, driven just to show the icky stories. Uh, one of the things my husband and I do almost every night is we go to one of those sites that talks about rescuing animals because my husband loves to see the transformation of some dog that was left to starve on the street or was abused. And then at the end of the three minutes, they're a happy pet. I mean, we both love, we love those kind of stories. So that's something to think about in your images, even if you're trying to talk about things that aren't good. Anticipating what's going to happen, like with that kitten, engaging characters, right? A whole bunch of different details here make for a better story. What does it mean to tell a story in images? And again, if I want to tell a story about human emotions, I'm mostly going to use an animal <laughs> to try to purvey, um, to uh, portray that particular emotion rather than use a person. It, I think it works a little better. Maybe I'm playing it safe, who knows, but it seems to work better. So now what we're going to do is look at tweaking and we're going to take a couple of images, this one first, and then we're going to take a couple of images and go through the process of tweaking. And the first thing we're going to look for is the simple crop. 
the image on the left was the original photo with no cropping as I pulled it off of Pixabay. And it's a nice photo. You can kind of hold your hand up and take a look at this photo um, and say, yeah, that's a nice photo. I like it. But then what I did on the right is I cropped it and I cropped it on the left and I cropped it on the right and I cropped it from the bottom and the top. So I cropped it on all four sides, right? And if you notice that I didn't just crop it, I looked, for example, on the left with that bush to see where would be a reasonable place that I could cut the photo and still show most, if not all, of that bush that's in the foreground. I think I did a pretty good job. And so you, it looks like the bush is standing alone and it's right there. Then on the right hand side, I looked at that little stone wall that's in front of the two benches and there was a gap in the original photo on the right hand side and I cropped at that gap. So what you see now is just the very, very, very end of that little stone wall there. And then what I did is I cropped that bush at the bottom of it. So not only did I crop out the other vegetation to the left, I cropped out the bottom of it right to the base of that bush that focuses on that. And then at the um, top of the photo, I looked at that tree and just at the beginning of where the two big branches on the tree um, branch out, that's where I chose to crop. So you'll notice that in the original, in the upper left-hand corner, there's kind of like a dark spot. It looks like maybe there's some vegetation that's gone or something. It's kind of a dark space. You have all the additional weeds and such from the bottom of the bushes on the left. You have more vegetation on the right. Now that I've cropped everything, the eye can better focus on the chairs. And so the chairs, in the, I mean, the benches in this beautiful place become much more the focus than sort of the ambiguous vegetation around. It's like, I'm telling the eye what I want to do. And this was simply by cropping the photo, using the cropping tools that you have within GoToWebinar and other places, right? Just very simple tools that we did that. And then I think not everyone, but most people looking at the before and after would say the one on the right tells, let's say, a better story because of the focus. <clears throat> so why do we tweak? There's several kinds of tweaking we can do. We can crop. We can lighten. We can adjust the contrast if it's too gray. We can adjust the color and we can colorize. So let me take you through these particular steps. And again, we're just going to take one photo and show you what to what we can do. On purpose, on the left, I took this photo. This is the original photo, dark and gloomy and ugly with the worn out building in the front. And there's a bunch of stuff happening in the back and you can't quite see anything. I would say this is not a very good photo. Uh, it may tell something to someone, but I don't know. I think I can make it better. So the first thing I did was crop it. And so we had the big picture and then we decided to focus on the building for whatever reason. I wanted people to look at the building and that building was going to be the story of what was going on more so than anything else. And then we have a secondary building that looks like it need patching, whatever. First thing I did was lighten it. Look at the difference. Isn't that amazing? All I did was lighten it. When you lighten something, it literally sends more energy to your eye, more information to your eye. And if you notice that by lightening it, more of the details of the photo come up. In fact, with the once you um, crop it and lighten it, you can see some of the stuff that's left around the debris that's left around that sad, sad building. And then I decided it was really too monochromatic right? It's almost a gray. I mean, the colors are so muted. I needed something stronger. So I decided to make it almost a little hysterical. I wanted to make a point. I wanted the colors to, to come out. And yeah, it's kind of ugly in my point of view. But again, I was trying to tell a stronger story about the abandoned building. And that ability to intensify the colors, again, was just something I pulled off of PowerPoint and clicked a button. And that was what it was able to do. Then, if you look, on the left was the original photo, untouched, and on the right is the new photo that better allows me to tell a story. 
And having done this a lot, I can tell you the more you practice, the better you'll be at it. And by the way, the more fun that you'll have as well. And then finally, we have this wonderful thing called colorizing, where we can take a color that's from the palette of the type that we're using in PowerPoint and basically put it on the image that we're using. So basically it's black and the color, and that's something we could do for fun. If you wanted a different impact about that building, didn't want people to even look at the color, just wanted them to look at the image. And this is an example of colorizing. Finally, there's a difference between using an image versus a photo in terms of the amount of information that's there. And it might be useful to look at the whole field of nature illustration to see why a lot of people will prefer a drawing to a photo when they're trying to uh, present detail of different kind. So here's some of the resources. And I would say that we have two pages worth of resources connected with these slides in the PDF that you can get downloaded uh, from the folks at Do Space. You can contact them for that. And this first slide are places where you can get software or images that are kind of fun to make what you're doing look a little special. And here are some books that I think really can inspire your ability to write stories. The best graphic magazine available is Communication Arts at the bottom. And unfortunately, these are now out of print, but the best design books I've ever seen for amateurs written by a woman named Robin Williams are still available through interlibrary loan and you can buy used copies online. And this can take you through a lot of steps of ways to use images. So let me just check. I haven't seen any questions or comments come in so far, but I think, do we have about a minute left right now? Or are we out of time in turning in terms of the program? I'm checking in with our producer. We, we are a bit over time. Ah, okay. Okay, so did any uh, questions come in? None at the moment. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, well, I think we're right here at time. So I'm gonna thank everyone for coming in. Thank you very much. And I don't charge for phone or email consultation at patternresearch.com. And um, so if there's anything I can do for you, let me know and hope to see you with the next Two Space program. Thank you. Thank you, Pam. And thank you everyone for coming.